from Barangaroo Studios, the AusBiz COB is the key stuff you need to know about the day in business and finance. Well, hello, hello. Welcome to the COB. I'm Nadine Blaney. Wonderful to be here with you. I have Scotty, David Scott from Stonex standing by. Just let me get you across what we are seeing right now in markets with the day done for trade on the SIBO Australia Index. We did see a bit of selling going into the close. Still, though, positive by about four-tenths of a percent. Big risk events on the horizon, as we well know. Uh, big tech earnings. We've got uh, the U.S. election. We've got inflation data tomorrow. But today, we're very much focused on the positive sentiment out there for the market. Overall, with the ASX climbing, we'll get the final figures from the S&P in just a moment. A retailer is really rumbling. Premier Investments, one of them. But Satire came out with some results. Um, so yeah, Premier Meyer saw the Lear getting a seat on the board and is Meyer's bigger shareholder right now. He must be smoking a cigar somewhere, I would imagine. And yeah, as I mentioned, inflation tomorrow is a big one. Uh, underlying inflation in particular, the RBA has told us that time and time again. All right, just a quick stroll around some of these sectors to see what outperformed. That would be the discretionary names. And uh, in large part, thanks to Premier, up by 9.6%. So while Meyer will get a bunch of the apparel businesses, JJ's, Doughty, there's a few others, um, yeah, Premier will be focused on Peter Alexander, XC Pajamas, and Smiggles as well, um, which is, you know, a hit. I'm, I've just left the Smiggle birthday party phase, I think, for good. And I can't say I'm going to miss it. All right, let's get to the banks. We've got all the banks doing well, so the financial sector looking good. And the miners as well, particularly mineral resources. It's actually one of the best performers on the 200, up by seven tenths of a percent. So we had a bit of news coming from... Uh, the company yesterday uh, just talking about you know it responding to questions on governance and process shortly today responding to an ASX aware letter but um, just a slight improvement of sentiment toward the miner in the wake of those tax allegations against its MD but also you know it's been hit quite hard uh, since it warned on lithium uh, a while back all right Meyer as I mentioned to take over Premier's apparel business Premier uh, one of the best performers on the 200 today, up by 9.6%. On the flip side, though, Meyer down by 1.5%. Setire shares really slumping on that disappointing trading update. Sales revenue increased by 22% to $155 million in the first quarter of FY25. Zipco kicking goals today over two and a half year high on a bumper half year profit. And City lifted its price target on Zip on that continued growth momentum in the United States. Uh, Blue Scope, though, dropped it slashed profit expectations for the first half, citing cost inflation. Coronado Global falling on a lower quarterly output. Romelius Resources flat, uh, posting quarterly group gold production of 62,000 ounces, around about there. Ansel hit a near three year high today on lifting its FY25 earnings per share guidance. Centuria Office REIT reaffirming its FFO guidance and Southern Cross Electrical Engineering up by a further 5% today, forecasting an increase in earnings in FY25. Also making news today, the Prime Minister Anthony Albanese has taken aim at author and former AFR columnist Joe Astin, whose recently published book, The Chairman's Lounge, accuses the Prime Minister of failing to declare Qantas travel upgrades while he served as Transport Minister. Aston wrote in his book, The Chairman's Lounge, that Mr. Albanese personally solicited and secured 22 free upgrades from Mr. Joyce when he was transport minister. Um, look, I, got, I went back and I went over the disclosures that Anthony Albanese made over a very long period of time of flight upgrades. Uh, and those have been put out there now by, by, me, by my book and, and that's going very badly for the for the, for the Prime Minister. I, I, I certainly didn't set out to target him. I mean, as a, but, but he was Transport Minister at the time. That's the thing. He was in charge of regulating the airline industry. So whether or not he declared upgrades, you know, you have to wonder whether it's really appropriate to be taking what are benefits worth tens of thousands of dollars cumulatively from stakeholders in, in your own portfolio. But there are a lot of politicians who take upgrades. And, you know, I would be careful throwing, if I was a, a politician out there throwing stones at Anthony Albanese, there are many, I wonder how many of them have not disclosed their upgrades. And I know, you know, there have to be a lot. PM found himself under fire in the book. It's less about politics and more about Qantas and its failings post-COVID. 
Alan Joyce's 15-year tenure and the board's apparent inability to rein him in toward the end. The, for Alan Joyce, you would say that it got to that point where he wasn't taking good advice, but perhaps he wasn't listening either. Um, and that happens to people when they're in, in their very powerful positions for too long. I mean, nobody should be CEO of a top Australian listed company for 15 years. That's too long. Um, and it's too long to be Prime Minister, it's, uh, it's, it, and it affects your judgment over time. And then the, the board, I think it's not so much hubris as weakness. And Alan Joyce was so strong and so trusted because he'd been through previous crises and he had the answer to every question. Um, and uh, the board was just not prepared or confident enough to, to stop him, uh, to keep him in line, you know, to manage him properly. It is their job to keep the CEO performing well. The company was in a crisis. Everyone in Australia could see that. Um, and instead of sort of saying, Alan, just pull it back a bit, maybe we just need to soften the edges here, maybe we should add some, you know, spending investment back in customer stuff, you know, just we could make a little bit less money this year. Instead, they ran around and said, this is also unfair. Alan Joyce is the best CEO in Australia. And so if you're Alan Joyce, in fairness to him, like, what are you going to say? Uh, what are you going to think? That you're doing the wrong thing when your board is saying that? So I think the board's failure is really important and it features very prominently in the book. And you can watch that full interview. We'll be playing it for you just at the end of this program. Or, of course, you can catch up on osbiz.com.au shortly thereafter if you're listening to this in podcast form. All right, let's get back to markets. The COB, David Scott, joining us from Stone X. Hey, Scotty, welcome to the program. So, a bit of a, an upward movement today, four tenths of a percent. So, investors still willing to take on risk. Why? Look, uh, you mentioned at the top there all those risk events that are coming up. Uh, it's going to be amazing trying to go and evolve through this week because uh, there's just simply so many things to go and keep an eye on. Tomorrow you mentioned that inflation report, but before that we get Alphabet earnings, AMD earnings as well, and that kickstarts that uh, magnificent seven, five of them at least over the course of the next three days. What are we seeing at the moment? Well, probably not a lot of volume going through. We're probably seeing a bit of month-end adjustment as well. But from a technical perspective, the ASX 200 today, I was looking at the futures market just before, it was a whole series of dojis, which is really kind of inconsistent price action. Then all of a sudden, we're seeing this nice breakout today. So maybe, just maybe, we could go and revisit those highs in the not too distant future. Okay, but a lot has to go right. Is that uh, me overstating things? It does. Look, we've come to expect that when it comes to the Magnificent Seven names, uh, they typically go and beat expectations. And whilst there's a lot of difference between our index and, of course, what they go and produce in terms of revenues and earnings, we can't help escape that you know, what happens with those earnings are going to be very influential on broader sentiment. So that's the first thing. And then you mentioned that inflation report. Well, that's where we could see a really, really big knee-jerk reaction at this point in time. There's lots of dispersion there exactly as to what we'll see tomorrow. And uh, that's going to go and create a lot of volatility around 11.30 when it's released. Yeah, okay. So in the best case scenario, we see hints that underlying inflation uh, is being wound back. You know, if some of those uh, inflationary pressures are easing, how likely do you think that is? Look, uh, we've seen a lot of other inflation reports around the world go and, and come in underneath expectations. Whether that's going to go and transpire across to Australia, that's yet to be determined. I don't go and look into the actual details, but I know from a, a market pricing perspective, if we were to go and see a real low ball outcome, and I'm talking about something less than, say, 0 0.7 for trimmed mean, then that's really going to go and have a violent reaction. And that would go and see the prospect of a rate cut this year come firmly back on the table. If we get, like, say, a 0.7 or a 0.8 around about where the median is located right now, probably a less meaningful market impact. And then, of course, we start talking about a, an upside surprise, which I think is probably the lesser of probabilities, then it's going to get nasty as well. So there are the tail risks, like maybe a 0.7 or under, or a 0.9. That would be the ones to get really, really interested in if you're a trader. Yeah, okay. So that gives us a little bit of uh, a guide for tomorrow. Um, look, we have the PCE in the United States. We've got jobs data as well. I was chatting with somebody earlier today that said it's the PCE uh, that is most important for the Fed. Um, but I thought, I thought labor was, was a big focus now. Yeah, I'll typically, I think I'm going to agree with you on that one. If PCE, you can't completely go and discount that, but the core PCE deflator, we've got such great mapping techniques now where forecasters can go and pull segments from CPI and the PPI reports, and it spits out a really accurate detail. 
often to two decimal places. So we don't really get any big surprises with that release. But to me, we've got the advanced reading of Q3 GDP. We know the Atlanta Fed GDP now forecast model when last out was pointing at 3.4% seasonally adjusted annual growth. That's enormous. And then we also go and get, uh, as you mentioned, the job start at the end of the week. Before that, the ADP employment report. To me, they're the ones to go and focus on in the near term. And then, of course, tonight, uh, Janet Yellen's uh, favourite uh, labour market indicator, the jobs, jobs survey as well. And that's going to be really interesting as well because we saw that unusually large increase coming through in August. Uh, looking for a small pullback at this month. If that doesn't happen, if we see another increase in job vacancies, then look out, the, uh, the Fed rate cut uh, bandwagon would have gone and left uh, a while ago. It means uh, that we probably won't see any move again from the, uh, from the Fed for some period of time. Yeah, right. Um, yeah, that jolt straw breed will forever be associated with Yellen in my mind as well. Okay, so um, Trump trade. Just wondering if you're seeing that being expressed across the platform or the questions that you're getting from clients, Scotty, because at least markets are firming up on the Trump victory side and potentially even a red sweep. Yeah, absolutely. I think that that's what we're now moving towards is the latter outcome. I think that to markets, you know, it's always hard to go and put your finger on exactly the probabilities, but I'd go and say probably 75% price. I think that the markets be more certain than what we're seeing with betting markets and the polls at this point in time. So that tells you that the, uh, the most violent reaction will be if that doesn't come to fruition. But you can see that coming through, particularly in the rates market. And I don't think it's really played out in its entirety right yet. But the statement of curves, we're seeing a big bear statement take place with twos and, and the tens moving higher than, I to say, 30s as well, even more so. To me, that's showing signs that we're expecting some pretty aggressive fiscal stimulus coming through, more expansionary fiscal policies, and maybe some pressure on the central bank as well. So, of course, that's what we're pricing in right now. But uh, come this time next week, uh, it could be a very different outcome. So we'll see what happens then. Oh, boy, Scotty. Oh, have we booked you in for post-election coverage? If not, we will do that soon. Thanks for joining us today. Short but sweet. Really appreciate it, mate. Not a problem, mate. You take care. Take care. All right. Uh, we said that the stock of the day, well, maybe I didn't say the stock of the day was Meyer. It was. Maybe it should have been Premier, considering all the gains that it made. But um, Francesco Destratus from Ordmanet and Mark Moreland from Team Invest obviously talked about both those companies. Let's take a listen. I, I think Meyer's probably a little bit exit at these levels and I probably wouldn't be buying it as them being the acquirer. Um, and after today, um, you know, Premier was trading on probably market PEs, probably, you know, fair value. Um, but after today, it's probably looking a bit expensive. So um, there might be a little bit more in the share price, but I, I, I wouldn't be rushing in to buy it at this stage. Um, but it, it, it does look interesting for Premier going forward. But if you just look at the history of it, 10 years, uh, uh, Premier was nine dollars eighty ten years ago. It's now thirty four dollars eighty, so that's like three three times over the last ten years. Maya was a dollar fifty one ten years ago. Now it's ninety four cents. So you know, it's dividends as well. But you know, bottom line is uh, that's about the equivalent performance. And if you go further back, interestingly, uh, it's nineteen ninety when Premier listed was a dollar twenty two. Now thirty four. Maya was uh, uh, three dollars forty four. Mm. Um, uh, in 2010, which is when they uh, listed on the split. So Meyer's gone down, it's less than 30% of what it was. If you've been a long-term shareholder, you've lost money. So we would, we would have touched Meyer for a long time. I think it's been in long-term decline, and that's department stores generally. It's tough business. So that is a hold for both Meyer and Premier from Ords and Mark Moreland would be selling. Okay, let's get to some of these leaders and laggards. The market voting with its feet when it comes to the result coming from Zipco. Boy, it's been a cracker of the year. I do recall one of our guests had Zip as its advent calendar pick last year. I think it was Henry Jennings from Marcus Today. We should get that going again this year, shouldn't we? You can... Uh, Write in or let me know if it's worth our while this year. You know what else was another one? <laughs> Just while I'm on it, Findy. Findy was a pick by um, Banyan Tree, Zach Riaz. Boy, if you would have listened to his advent calendar pick last year, you would have done well. Anyways, I digress. Premier up by 9.6%, Mineral Resources 7%, Tap Corp up by 5.5%. Flipping the page to the laggards, 
And you can see here, save for Telix Pharmaceuticals, which was off by 3.3%. It's all those in the resources space, and Coronado did put out its production update down off the back of that, as did Samfire. Uh, off by 3.9%. Paladin, it's uh, broker moves in the wake of its production report yesterday. Small to mid cap space, we've got LIS Energy. Yeah, that uh, really going well, up by 44%. And it had an announcement out yesterday, and it's just slipped from my mind what it is, but we're endeavoring to get them in to speak with us. A vinyl, recouping some of its losses, up by 15%. Flipping the page, and uh, we've got Black Cat Syndicate off by close to 12%, Money Me down by 11.5%, and Live Verdure off by 11%. Still do not understand what that company does or why people tell me it is the ASX's greatest AI play. Um, I'll try to figure it out on your behalf at some point. On overnight, you heard Scotty and I talking about jolts. Will people feel confident enough to cut, uh, quit their jobs? one of the measures you look at when you're considering that jolt job report. We get the consumer confidence read from the conference board and home prices for August though, so a backward looking read in the United States. Uh, here tomorrow it is all about the inflation data, 11.30 a.m. You're going to be wanting to be watching us live on osbiz.com.au. We've also got a couple AGMs coming through, particularly Whitehaven Coal and BHP. So a quick look in at where this market has finished, up by about four-tenths of a percent. The S&P ASX 200 up by three-tenths of a percent, 8,250. Looking around the region, Japan's market solidly in positive territory, but we've got some selling in Chinese mainland markets, at least as we make our way toward this European open. Uh, Brent crude firming light crude as well. Um, we are watching e-minis in the United States coming under a bit of pressure, but again, really big week when it comes to um, tech results, which do start tonight in earnest.